Okay, well, hello everyone. My name is Jennifer Reyes. I am the Health Programs Coordinator for League of United Latin American Citizens, also known as LULAC. We are the largest and oldest Latino civil rights organization. The mission of LULAC is to advance the economic condition, educational attainment, political influence, housing, health, and civil rights of the Hispanic population in the United States. Thank you to those across the country who are tuning in today to discuss an important issue that is important to LULAC's mission. LULAC is dedicated to health equity among the Latino community. That is why we launched our Latinos Living Healthy initiative to discuss the health issues that impact our community, including tobacco use, obesity, HIV and AIDS, and the lack of representation in clinical research. LULAC's plan is to address these health inequities by providing educational resources and webinars. LULAC's work addresses individual and community change, including developing and sustaining partnerships with local communities, schools, healthcare providers, and government agencies. It is important to address how tobacco products continue to negatively impact the health and well being of Latinos and our youth. Tobacco companies are intentional with their marketing in low income communities to make smoking appear appealing, which then increases adolescents' desire to smoke. In addition to that, these companies offer a variety of tobacco flavors to appeal to a younger audience. It is imperative that we use our voices to advocate for our communities to see the changes we want to see in policy. Restricting the sales of flavored tobacco products is an important step in protecting our youth from these big tobacco companies that continue to target them with their advertisements. Today, we have Gustavo Torres um, joining us to share some valuable information and expertise. Gustavo Torres has been involved in the tobacco control movement for the past 25 years. He began his work in tobacco control as a youth advocate in California and continued his career in the fields in Boston where he was a program manager with Fenway Community Health and the National Network for LGBT Health Equity, one of the CDC funded priority population networks. As a young adult, Gustavo served on Legacy Now the Truth Initiative um, as a national, uh, I mean, sorry, on the National Speakers Bureau and the National Activism Council. And in 2012, he was recognized for his efforts with the Chell Blazers Award for outstanding and continuous leadership in the tobacco control movement by legacy. Currently, Gustavo is the director of youth advocacy for the campaign for tobacco free kids, where he oversees the development and implementation of innovative youth focused programs, including Taking Down Tobacco, the four-time award-winning online youth advocacy training program, changing the way we engage and train you to be hashtag be the first um, tobacco-free generation. Welcome, Gustavo. Thank you so much, Jennifer, um, for that lovely introduction. Um, you know, we've been doing these Zoom meetings for, for so long now. Um, I know so many of you are on Zoom fatigue, um, so I really want to first thank you all for joining us this evening as we talk about um, tobacco and its impact within Hispanic Latino communities, um, but really understand how this industry has continued to sell a product that uh, when used as intended could kill you. Um, so I am very, very excited and grateful for LULAC for providing this platform and for um, the partnership as we really look to uh, reduce the inequities tobacco has caused, um, not only within Hispanic Latino communities, but all of our communities, not only here in the United States, but across the globe. So with that, um, we'll jump into um, today's presentation. Um, this is Take, Take Down Tobacco 101. So our goal today is really just to share a little bit about um, uh, the current issues that we're facing as it relates to tobacco, um, including the emergence of e-cigarettes and the e-cigarette epidemic. Um, before we really jump in to a lot of the conversation today, um, we are the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids. Uh, we're a national advocacy organization, um, really helping to um, create a world that is free from tobacco, uh, the commercial tobacco and, and uh, uh, addiction, um, specifically um, protecting young people from a lifetime of addiction. 
Um, so throughout today's conversation, um, I just want to make a very uh, quick clarification on uh, the different types of tobacco, um, traditional tobacco versus commercial tobacco. Um, so when we're talking about traditional tobacco, um, traditional tobacco is sacred tobacco. Um, it's very different um, from commercial tobacco in, a, in many ways. Um, uh, traditional tobacco has been used for centuries by American Indians and Alaska Natives in sacred um, ways, including ceremonial and medicinal purposes. So it's very, it's very important for us to showcase the distinction of commercial tobacco, which is manufactured tobacco like cigarettes. Um, when we talk about tobacco in this course, we, we really do mean commercial tobacco that is mass produced, sold for profit and designed to be highly addictive. So um, understanding a little bit about where we are, as many of you know, um, tobacco is still a huge issue in all of our communities. So I, I'm sure you may have friends or family um, who, are, who currently use tobacco or are trying to quit. Um, and we know tobacco, commercial tobacco, is still a serious problem in this, in this country and across the globe. It's the number one cause of preventable death and disease. Um, it really impacts the health and futures of young people. As we know, nicotine impacts the developing adolescent brain. Um, and it targets and impacts others more um, based on the, the, the industries behind them, which are really trying to sell death, disease, and addiction. Um, not only does it have a huge impact on our environment, but um, it also is really uh, uh, impacting Hispanic Latinos communities dramatically, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, so currently, 32% um, of uh, high school students in 2009 reported using any tobacco product, so whether that's e-cigarettes at 27%, um, cigars at... Um, 7.6%, cigarettes at 5.8%, or smokeless tobacco, or even hookah, um, this is a, a concern. Um, many of these products contain nicotine, and as we know, nicotine is addictive. Um, and we hear a lot of young people, you know, talking about, uh, you know, if they've started, how, how, how much of a struggle it is to quit. And so we're, we're really talking today about understanding the industry's marketing manipulation to sell these products um, and how we could take our collective power back um, and really put people over profit rather than an industry that is putting profit over, over people, um, which has dramatic impacts on our communities. Um, so some fun little facts, the tobacco group spends over $1 million every hour on marketing in the United States. That's $9.1 billion every year. Um, so thinking, how much is that? <laughs> uh, it's enough to feed over 8.3 million US families for a month. So thinking about all of the issues that um, we are facing uh, across this country, you have an industry that is spending a million dollars every hour just to market their product. Um, so if they're spending a million dollars every hour just to market their product, um, you could start to, to pull it all together and really understand um, that they, they have to put a lot of money into selling a product that when used as intended could kill you, but also is designed really for addiction. Um, and this isn't even including you know, their profits. So they're spending $1 million now. Um, so when we talk a little bit about big tobacco, we're talking about, uh, we're talking about um, large tobacco companies um, who are selling products. So um, such as Altria, um, RJ Reynolds, um, some fun facts um, for you all. Um, Altria, um, who owns the, the largest, um, uh, one of the largest companies that uh, sell products that are um, extremely popular amongst teens. So between Altria and Reynolds brands. So Altria, Altria owns the most popular cigarette brand, which is Marlboro. Um, two of the three most popular smokeless tobacco brands, um, Copenhagen and Skull. And the most popular little cigarette, uh, little cigar brand, which is Black and Miles. 
Um, and one thing that I think we all find surprising when an industry says they're trying to um, create a smoke-free world um, is that Altria bought 35% of Juul, the most popular vaping device um, uh, uh, to date. Um, and so when we think really about the industry that has been proven racketeers who have lied in Congress about the, the addiction of their product, um, how do we really trust anything that these corporations put out when we know that these nicotine delivery devices really will impact our communities because we've seen that um, time after time. So what we know is, you know, nicotine really reaches your brain within 10 seconds of entering your body. Um, so as young people, your brains are still developing. Um, so you're really sensitive to nicotine and nicotine exposure really does rewire your brain. Um, so even if you do smoke, um, you know, or, or vape just once in a while, it could really lead for cravings um, for addiction for some young people. Um, and so as we really talk about nicotine, you know, we want to remember that not only is this highly addictive, um, but it really does impact the way your brain develops and how you start thinking um, in, in having an impact on memory and attention issues. Um, it actually could worsen stress um, and anxiety and cause mood, mood swings. So counter to popular belief, um, you know, it's not a stress reliever, but it could be, even be a stress inducer. Um, so as we know, um, young people are seven times more likely to vape nicotine than adults, um, which I think when we really think about what, what we're facing today in this issue is when you have more young people using these products and these products are being sold in flavors um, that are really highly appealing to young people, um, there's a huge concern there. Um, commercial tobacco is the only legal product that when used as intended will kill half of its users. Um, let me just say that one more time, because when I first heard this as a young person and started to learn a lot about the industry, I think I was the most um, caught off guard by the fact that these products, commercial tobacco, it's the only legal product that's allowed to be sold that when used as intended will kill half of its users. Um, again, you know, selling death and disease, um, it really is preventable. Commercial tobacco is the number one preventable cause of death in the world. Um, sadly, it does kill um, a dramatic amount of people. Um, in the United States specifically, one person dies every 66 seconds. That's about 1,300 people a day, over 480,000 people every single year. Um, as, as we do know, um, we've all heard that smoking does impact um, your appearance and health from premature wrinkles to, um, uh, to having issues with your, your oral hygiene. Um, so it could, you know, you get dry, discolored skin, you could have nasty bad breath, it stunts your lungs, and it could turn your fingers um, yellow and stain your fingernails. It also, again, as we, we talk, it changes the way your brain uh, works um, and makes stress work or makes stress worse. Um, so those are just a few ways smoking and nicotine can damage your body as a young person. Um, but these are the things that we all know, right? As we hear all of these effects. Um, but one thing to, to really kind of keep in mind is on average, smokers die 10 years sooner than non-smokers. So again, if we're talking about setting ourselves up for the healthiest life as we move forward, we have to understand the impacts of this product specifically on, uh, on us, not only in the short term through addiction and some of the other things I've mentioned, but again, thinking over the long term, how tobacco really is impacting you and your communities. So when we talk a little bit about secondhand smoke um, and your body, um, one in four non-smokers are exposed to secondhand smoke in the United States. Um, and secondhand smoke or secondhand cigarette smoke causes about uh, 41,000 deaths to non-smokers each year. So not only does this product impact um, the direct user, um, research and studies show that it directly impacts um, folks around you. Um, so you can see the ways in which secondhand smoke from all tobacco products really impact your health. Um, and it's just kind of important to really understand that it's not just you that it's impacting. It really is the environments that you're around as well.
So when we think about um, some other tobacco products, specifically, we talk about hookah smoke. It has many of the same cancer-causing chemicals found in cigarette smoke, um, which again is a huge concern. Um, also, when you're sitting there um, puffing on a hookah, um, the average time, they say, might be around an hour. So you could be consuming even more nicotine um, uh, through hookah use as well, um, which again is a concern. And another kind of gross thing to think about is when a lot of people are just sitting around sharing a hookah, um, you know, every person, while sometimes there's a little mouthpiece, you're still increasing your risk of getting cold sores, colds, um, because you are then sharing um, uh, a device that uh, is going from person's mouth to mouth, which I just think it's kind of a little bit gross. I don't know about y'all. Um, secondhand vape really contains high concentrations of fine particles that really um, studies are showing are really impacting lung development and lung growth. Um, again, you know, we've heard, you know, cigarettes are really bad for your lungs. Um, but what we do know is secondhand vape um, contains high concentrations of these fine particulates that could be impactful to your lungs, but also to the direct user um, as well. And again, when we think about secondhand smoke and we think about the from cigarettes, you know, it really delivers enough nicotine to the, to the brain that really could change the way it works, right? So we know nicotine is highly addictive. Um, we know it rewires your brain. Um, and impacts, you know, the, the development and even secondhand smoke um, could, could have these effects, um, which we all want to just be mindful of. And then more importantly, as we know, secondhand smoke from cigarettes and cigarette regulos could cause heart disease, um, which is uh, uh, one of the number one issues amongst the Hispanic Latino communities that we really need to um, address. So when we think about some of the health consequences, more broadly, we know, you know, again, cancer and heart disease are the first and second leading causes of death um, uh, amongst Hispanic uh, Latino communities. Um, and tobacco use is an important risk factor to this. More than 4,300 Hispanic and Latinos are diagnosed um, with a tobacco related cancer each year, and then more than 1,800 die from a tobacco related cancer uh, each year. So, again, as you know, these are our well as our cousins, our, our, our family that are being not only truly impacted, but this is our culture and our history that uh, is being wiped away um, based on a, a, a product that um, is designed for addiction um, to keep you addicted. Um, and it, again, could kill half of its users. Lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer deaths amongst Hispanic men and the leading cause amongst Hispanic uh, women. So again, is, you know, our communities are heavily being impacted by this, um, by this product. Um, and when we think about all of these other risk factors, why would we add another product like tobacco, um, which could further exacerbate um, challenges our communities are already facing? So when we think a little bit about commercial tobacco and young people, um, one thing that we know for sure is about 95% of smokers start before the age of 21. Um, that's why you've seen a lot of campaigns um, to really raise the minimum sale age of tobacco to 21. So by reducing access to the products, um, you help to reduce youth initiation, more importantly. Um, but that's only part of the, 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 the battle. We could reduce access, but... Um, unless we reduce the availability specifically of, let's say flavored tobacco products, we're gonna to continue to set our young people up for lifetimes of addiction. And for every one smoker who dies from a tobacco related illness, they're replaced by two um, new younger smokers. And the industry in their documents, you know, have really, you know, stated young adult smokers are the only source of replacement smokers. If younger adults turn away from smoking, the industry must decline just as a population which does not give birth will really eventually dwindle. So they understand that young people are the, the prime market for them um, and that without us, without new smokers every single day, um, it really impacts their business. So that's why this industry fights so hard against policies that are protecting communities from their product because it, again, just impacts their, their, their pockets and the money that they make. Um, one thing that we've seen, especially as uh, 
when Juul hit the market in 2015, they came out with all of these slick, um, high nicotine levels and youth friendly flavored um, uh, product, right? And it really gained in popularity amongst young people. Um, and Juul with other vape, vape companies have really taken a page out of Big Tobacco's playbook um, by promoting the highly addictive product directly to young people, really using lifestyle branding as a way to try to change social norms around nicotine and tobacco use by promoting um, vapor, uh, vape products, uh, which again, not really letting the consumer know the true health effects of this issue. And so, you know, while we've made um, incredible progress, there's a lot of work that's taking place right now to combat this industry. Um, uh, U.S. Congress um, uh, has, uh, in, through a congressional investigation, have found that Juul deliberately targeted young people. Um, as you can see with some of the advertising, um, you know, uh, by building, you know, online influencers, um, supporting after school programs and summer camps for kids as, as young as eight and uh, in school and classroom presentations. So again, you know, what the industry did was they infiltrated um, where young people will, young, young people even gather to learn. Um, to again, try to manipulate and sell their product. So while we've you know, really been able to reduce high school smoking rates um, by almost 80% um, over the last two decades, um, we're really facing a huge problem with the increase in youth, uh, high school youth e-cigarette use rates, um, which also is really impacting all the way down to middle school students. And so we're starting to see more and more uh, of uh, this impact, which is again, a huge concern um, because you, again, we have an industry that is really looking to um, addict a generation for which we know now will definitely impact, could definitely impact your health. Um, so if you vape, um, as we know, there's research that says you're more likely to even start smoking cigarettes. Um, so it's just really important for us to really understand um, that um, you know, this isn't just a, a fad, right? Um, the industry is really marketing and manipulating communities, um, young people in particular, to utilize these products. And with over five um, plus million teens using e-cigarettes, this is why the current youth e-cigarette youth e epidemic is such a huge concern. We have one in four um, teens who are now using these products. Um, and almost 5,000 youth start vaping every single day, which again is why the work that we're doing here at the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids in collaboration with LULAC is so vital to really reduce these numbers so we continue to set our communities up for success. Specifically, when we start looking at tobacco's impact within the Hispanic Latino community, 4.6% um, of high school students um, were current cigarette smokers, um, it's 18.9%, nearly 19% of Hispanic Latino students um, reported currently using e-cigarettes. And overall, again, nearly one in four, 23% of high school Hispanic uh, Latino students are currently using users of any tobacco product. Um, again, which is a, a huge concern, um, but also means the tobacco industry is winning. So when we think about the impact of um, flavored tobacco, um, four out of five young people who've ever used commercial tobacco started with a flavored product. Um, and almost all, 97% of teen vapors use flavored tobacco products. Um, this again is why the work that we're doing is so vital right now to address flavors, because the industry knows that flavored tobacco is really what hooks young people. Um, they came out with these cigarettes in, in the past, it worked, um, and this is why um, flavored tobacco products like cigarettes were taken off the market um, with the exception of uh, menthol. So when you think um, around e-cigarettes and, and the challenge that we're really facing right now is 64% um, uh, of young people report uh, using menthol and mint e-cigarettes. 55% um, um, use menthol cigarettes. So menthol still is a characterizing flavor. Um, we've all had, you know, maybe when you were younger, um, some Vicks Vapor Rub, you know, 
rubbed on your chest that really opens up your lungs and your airways. Um, and so what menthol really does is it masks the, the taste of tobacco, masks the, the, the poison, as my good friend, Dr. Gardner would say, um, that uh, really helps the, the, the user inhale deeper, um, which um, sets young people up again for that lifetime of addiction but also other lung problems, right? Because you're breathing in these products even deeper. Um, so this is why it's important for FDA to really take strong action. And while um, certain products were taken off the market, um, flavored tobacco products with the exception of mint and menthol, um, there still are over 1500 flavors of uh, e-cigarette uh, products that are still on the market that are disposables, um, which again, um, not only does it just impact um, youth use of these products, but also has a huge impact on the environment, which we'll talk a little, about, little bit about later. Um, one thing we do know is commercial tobacco is not an equal opportunity killer. Um, commercial tobacco impacts all of our communities, um, every racial group, um, LGBT communities, low-income communities, um, uh, folks who uh, experience homelessness. Um, so all of this really goes back to um, how the industry is marketing a product um, really to reach communities that they've identified as quote unquote vulnerable um, or susceptible to their product. So you'll see um, many times when you go to the bodega, the corner store, you see all of the tobacco products that are um, on the counters. Um, you see the tobacco advertisements. Um, on the windows um, as you're walking in or on the gas pumps. And then when you walk into the store, you see the power walls of tobacco products um, at checkout. And in a lot of places, you see these tobacco products placed right near candy, um, which again, I don't think is by mistake. We also see the industry um, utilizing magazines uh, with high youth readership to market their product. Again, trying to change social norms and, and, and mark the product to specific uh, communities. Um, as we think a little bit more about the cultural appropriation of tobacco within our communities, you see that um, you know, the, the tobacco companies you know, cozy up to our communities and say, you know, we'll provide funding, you know, things of that nature, while at the same time selling a product that impacts our communities dramatically. Um, and so with their continued marketing of these products and then influencing, uh, uh, building a, a influencer network within social media, they really know what they're doing and trying to target young people. And specifically, we're seeing menthol, um, which is a huge debate. And that's why across the country, many states and localities have uh, created uh, flavored tobacco bans that include menthol, understanding that it is highly addictive um, and it has been targeted specifically in many instances to um, African-American, Black communities, Hispanic, Latino communities, LGBT communities, et cetera. Um, so it's a, a huge concern um, because again, this is you know, our, our culture, our history that is being impacted. Um, there's a really cool documentary called Black Lives, Black Lungs um, that was developed by uh, Lincoln Mundy um, so we'll, we'll throw that in the chat. Um, so if you have a moment at some point, um, definitely check it out. It's a really cool, short, um, short documentary uh, that really looks at how we got to the place where we are now with menthol. Um, so definitely encourage you all to check it out. Um, so thinking about the, the top tobacco or tobacco and e-cigarette brands. Um, now we're seeing a huge shift around menthol. Um, but again, is you know, menthol really does just mask um, the harshness of these products and this, these issues. More importantly, um, it definitely, again, is still just that design for addiction in a way that is impacting more black and brown communities across this country. Um, and, and the industry knows exactly what they're doing in manipulating communities um, through marketing, um, et cetera, that has caused us to be in the, the position where we are now, um, which is why it's so important that FDA um, ban 
all flavored tobacco products, including menthol, to really ensure that we're putting our communities first. So when we think a little bit about the targeting uh, of the tobacco tree to the Hispanic Latino communities, you know, in the early 80s, big tobacco companies, you know, have targeted their marketing towards Hispanic Latino populations. And a lot of their internal documents um, revealed that, you know, they, they deemed our population as lucrative, easy to reach, um, and under-marketed. Um, and the tobacco tree even compensated, you know, Hispanic Latino merchants for displaying advertisements in predominantly Hispanic Latino neighborhoods. Um, so if you're on, um, type in the chat if you've ever seen tobacco advertising in your community. Um, and I encourage all of you, next time you are walking, um, you know, to school or walking within your community to, to count how many of these advertisements you actually see. And you'll start to understand that it's really no coincidence in certain neighborhoods, there's higher concentration of marketing of these products um, than in other neighborhoods. So when we talk a little bit about environmental tobacco, um, the environment and commercial tobacco, I think this is one thing that's really important for all of us to really understand. Um, as we talk about the, the climate justice movement, we talk about preserving um, our community. Commercial tobacco um, pollutes the air, the water, the trees, the soil, causes fires, litter. Um, tobacco cigarette butts are the most littered item um, on beaches across this country. And, you know, each year 4.6 trillion cigarette butts are littered. Um, you know, one thing that you might not know is um, within the cigarette butt, that is made up of, you know, these, the, this fibers and microplastics. So while um, cigarette butts don't necessarily um, uh, decompose, you know, overnight, um, when they do start breaking down, they're releasing again more microplastics into um, into our environment, which continues to impact our waterways, impacts um, wildlife, and really um, have devastating effects to the what we're all trying to do and um, create a, a healthier, more just living space as well. So. When we start talking, you know, when you really start to understand a little bit about this industry and how they're marketing the product, I hope um, it really frustrates you and creates um, some anger. Um, because I know I've been doing this as a young person because my mom smoked tobacco um, and many of my friends and family, um, you know, use tobacco all throughout, you know, my growing up. And and I started this work for my mom because I really wanted to help her quit, but I realized that this industry is selling death, disease, and addiction, not only here in the United States and across the globe. So while my mission was really focused on helping her quit, um, I quickly learned that it's bigger and greater than that. Um, so if you do know anybody who is struggling to quit or would like to some support, you can call or share the, the quit line, 1-800-QUIT-NOW. Um, which is a free confidential helpline um, to help folks with quitting smoking. You could text or share, take, if you text take down to 88709, um, the Truth Initiative has a really great text to quit program that is really helping, um, valuable in helping uh, young people quit. Um, a member of our team will drop um, some Spanish language um, quit lines in the chat as well. But more importantly, the biggest thing that I want to encourage each and every one of you to really do is advocate, be an advocate. Um, you know, when we stand up for what we believe in, when we stand up for what's right and we advocate and utilize our voice, um, not only are we creating um, the generation of which, you know, we're living in and the generation we want to live in, um, but what we're doing is we're showing others the power of a collective voice. And as our communities, um, face so many different issues. It's so important for us to really be strong advocates. Um, and I hope through the resources that you could learn and receive from the work at the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids um, at takingdowntobacco.org, you could start to um, level up your advocacy skills through our online training program, uh, Take Down Tobacco. So if you go to takingdowntobacco.org, um, you'll be able to, to utilize um, all of the resources um, that are shared. 
So with that, um, I would like to kind of open it up um, if there's any um, anyone on the line who um, would like to share their experience um, if they um, uh, have been impacted by tobacco, um, you know, just drop it in the chat. Um, would also love to to hear where people are from. Um, so again, um, I'm Gustavo Torres. While I'm from California and I lived in Boston, I currently live in Washington D.C. Um, so I'll kind of open it up for any potential questions that anybody on the line might have. Um, so with, doesn't look like we have any questions. I'd like to invite Jennifer back um, to kind of have a little bit of a dialogue about, um, you know, what we're, just a little bit about what you're seeing in your community, Jennifer, um, and how tobacco, how you've seen tobacco impact um, your family peers. Yeah, definitely. Um, I come from a largely, sorry. I come from a largely um, Latino um, undocumented um, community. So I definitely see um, ads everywhere. Like if you go to the gas station, if you go, like you said, to, um, a small like community market, you see those everywhere. Um, my dad is a smoker and um, so are my uncles. Um, one of my uncles recently was able to quit smoking, but it was definitely a challenge for him. He was a smoker pretty much like his whole life. Um, and he was one of those people that was like highly addicted to it. Like mm -hmm. I'm talking about smoking a whole pack a day, kind of addicted to it. Um, but yeah, so he's definitely overcome that. And um, I guess it goes back to what you said, um, that 95% of smokers start before the age of 21. That was um, a really great fact that I didn't know. Um, and that makes a lot of sense too, because my uncles and my dad, like they both, or they all started like at a very young age. Um, I guess just because I guess the times it was like, legal back then too you can smoke on airplanes you can smoke anywhere um but yeah definitely um an interesting fact well and i think what's also interesting because similarly with my mom and uh, many of my my aunts and uncles um still who do use these products and and are trying to quit my mom thankfully have quit um but it's a consistent struggle right because they've been using this product for so long and as we know, nicotine does kind of rewire your brain. So it's like you are you are forced to buy that product because like, you know, it that the cravings at times could be so uh, incredibly intense. Um, so um, it's awesome to hear about your uncle um, in his quit journey. Um, so what 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 advice, you know, in 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 seeing that, you know, and, and knowing that, uh, you know, this tobacco use starts at such a young age and it's, you know, really by design, right? Cause the tobacco industry, you know, I don't know if some people know this, but there's even, we, we all know the Flintstones vitamins, right? We all know the Flintstones cartoon, just in general, you know, Winston Salem actually, you know, had the Flintstones, um, you know, a Flintstones commercials selling cigarettes, right? Um, and you're just like, you know, when you, we, when you hear about some of these things and then you see them, you're like, this was not a coincidence. Yeah. Right? Exactly that comment, the fact that Flintstones is like a child, you know, like cartoon, um, it make, it made me think back to like the ice cream trucks where they used to sell those, um, cigarettes. They were like gum, but like they come in a little box and they're shaped like cigarettes. Um, and then if you like, I know I used to buy them and then you just pretend like oh like I'm so cool but like that that's that's the issue like they present it for you to seem cool to seem I don't know hip um but yeah definitely to try to normalize it though right, right? by normalizing it within our community it's like oh everyone's doing it it's yeah. not fine and then you see you know at the time there were so many celebrities and that were were you know using big tobacco on the big screen and you know things things like that and so you wanted to emulate that right um so i think it, it goes back to again how this industry has 
continued to, you know, evolve throughout time um, with their, their marketing and advertising um, of these, this kind of lifestyle brand. Because again, if we change social norms around us and we normalize it, then it's like, oh yeah, well, that's just the thing. And we've done so much to denormalize tobacco use within our communities um, and reduce tobacco use. That's, I think, why the e-cigarette epidemic was such a is still such a huge concern for us because we're seeing the exact same things the industry has done previously replicated just with a new product. Yeah, definitely. Um, like I know when I was like in high school um, and even in college, um, people weren't really smoking like the traditional cigarettes. It was more the e-cigarettes or like hookah because it's it was like the new thing. Uh, e-cigarettes were seen like innovative or like because it's um, like electronic um, or people thought it was safer because like one of the parents earlier in um, a webinar mentioned um, that they thought it was just water, um, but there are chemicals in it that are dangerous um, and harmful to you. Um, but yeah, definitely they are changing up their tactics to appeal to younger gener um, the younger generation because um, they know that traditional cigarettes aren't really their market as much. Yeah. Well, I think too, what I, what I think is interesting as we've seen the e-cigarette epidemic, you, you kind of hit one thing with innovation, right? You know, I, I'm a little bit older than you, um, but as we've seen throughout the generations, um, how quickly, you know, your generation, our generation has seen the evolution of technology, right? And so, you know, you have these then products that are, you know, trying to be all hip and cool or, you know, oh yeah, it's just vapor. But then again, they don't tell you that it also is a highly addictive substance, um, right? Um, you know, masked with, you know, fruit and candy flavors. I think that was the one thing too, is when you think about over 15,000 flavors, you know, from unicorn puke, right? Unicorn puke, that just sounds gross. Um, but just the, the, the evolution and then, you know, the, the flavors, you know, cotton candy, mango, all of these things. It's like, who are you really targeting with this? Um, so thinking a little bit about, you know, ways to take action on this issue, I think, you know, we're working in partnership together, um, you know, and, and looking at ways to actually um, take action. Uh, against big tobacco. And I, I know there's a couple different ways that you've seen that we have available. Um, one is on our take action page at tobaccofreekids.org slash take action or slash get dash involved. My apologies. Um, so what's one, what is one of your hopes or what would you like to see for the future um, as it relates specifically to our communities um, and this product and these issues? Yeah, so definitely continuing to support the policies that, um, you know, ban the um, flavored cigarettes or flavored tobacco products, um, but also just like advocating within your own communities, like get these tobacco companies out. Um, they're there for a reason. They know that, um, like you mentioned earlier, um, they're they're targeting these vulnerable communities um, to get them hooked for, for life. Um, so, you know, just being advocates of your own community um, and making sure that um, one, we're all educated that, um, you know, the effects um, of the tobacco can have on you like physically, mentally, um, and just, you know, how highly addictive it is and how next generations could probably mimic you and, you know, pick up your patterns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you're totally right in the, you know, the advocacy part, right, and standing up for your community. And I think between the Hispanic Latino community, there's so many different subgroups within the community, we kind of all get lumped into one sometimes. But understanding that in each individual community, that collective action and that collective voice, um, you know, raising your voice on tobacco, is just one issue and hopefully through the work that we're all doing together we can continue to provide tools and resources to strengthen our communities um, um, 
through uh, advocacy, right? And understanding the advocacy process, understanding how these systems operate. And, you know, when we do understand how they operate, then start chipping away at um, dismantling some of these systems that outright impact our communities negatively, um, especially as we, we move forward with this health justice movement. Um, so I think that's one thing that I, I kind of encourage everyone um, is, is really, you know, advocate for something, right? Um, advocate for yourself, first and foremost. And secondly, look at the issues that are impacting your community. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, tobacco is, is one of those that you, you want to get involved with. Um, understanding the dramatic impact it has. And I think as we move forward, um, we really do need to push the FDA to ban flavored tobacco products, all flavored tobacco products, um, including menthol. Um, and, but it all really starts um, on the ground. It all really starts with community. Um, and so building community first around these issues, looking at health justice and how we could seize control uh, of our future um, and not allow industries to continue to, to prey upon our communities um, and our current generation. So that's great. Um, and we'll see if there's any other questions that we've received. Does not look like it at the moment. Um, so I think with that, any any kind of closing statements on your end, Jennifer? No, um, just thank you for, to yourself and the Tobacco Free team for joining us on this important um, conversation um, and just learning a little bit more about how e-cigarettes or um, tobacco products, you know, play a role in uh, you know physical and mental um, health but also like sharing how this can also be an environmental issue, which is, um, if I'm being honest, that's not one thing that I had like thought about. Um, so thank you for that. Um, yeah, and if you want to learn more about tobacco, you can visit Lulac's um, page. We just launched a website today and then there you can find our um, English tobacco toolkit. We're still working on the Spanish one, but we'll definitely get that on the website as soon as we can. Um, to learn a little bit about tobacco and then our partnership with the Tobacco Free campaign. Great. Well, again, thank you so much for having me. Um, and I, again, look forward to our continued collaborations together um, uh, in the future. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much.